How do we decide if free software is trustworthy? Free isn't open source. Are there any apps or functions we would not trust with free software? Thoughts on biohacking with privacy and security in mind? How we approach threat models and kind of the complexities around that? How ISPs collect data? And hopefully you'll learn some fun things today. Let's dive right into these. Again, these are from our patrons on patreon.com slash surveillance pod if you wanna ask us a question for next week. Thank you all for asking us questions. We really love them. So let's go ahead and dive into Lady Lucifer who asks, how do you personally decide if free software is trustworthy, especially when it comes to custom ROMs or desktop operating systems? A malicious app can be sandboxed to a degree, but if the OS itself is compromised, it seems like that's pretty much game over. Honestly, the way I look at free software isn't too different from proprietary software. And if you want kind of an insight into how that looks, I think the criteria on my end, like techlore.tech slash resources, there's a list of criteria. It's going to go into things like having public teams, having a long track record with really good history, having some community oversight, getting consistent security updates, just seeing the general privacy and security commitment through their features, through their privacy policy. There's a lot of things you can look at that tell you almost right away just how committed they are to offering something that's good and at least guarantees some decent privacy and security. So that's normally where I start. And that normally, once you kind of get experience for it, can get you pretty far to be able to see if something's trustworthy. There's always a bit of risk, but I don't think that using free and open source software is in any way more or less trustworthy for, and if anything, I would argue it's more trustworthy, actually, in a lot of situations like this. So do you have anything to say about the first question? It's very similar to yours. The main thing I look for is the size of the project, because if it's like somebody's small little project that nobody's ever heard of, I don't know how to read code. So I can't really vet that myself. Thankfully, I do have other people I can go to that I can be like, hey, what are your opinions on this? Are there any red flags? They don't sit down and do like deep, deep, detailed audits, but they'll kind of skim it. They'll look for anything that jumps out at them as like, well, that's a weird claim or like, I don't understand why they're doing it this way. But yeah, I look for something that, like you said, has a lot of community support that has been around for a while that has a lot of eyes on it, which again, does not mean it's definitely safe, but the more eyes you have on it, the more likely that people will find things and catch them. And this is kind of digging a little deeper, but I look for what are other, other people saying about them? You know, if somebody's like, oh yeah, I submitted a bug report and they never replied or like they fixed it, and never replied. Like to me, it's like, okay, well, the, the, I'm glad they fixed it, but the fact that they didn't send you like a thanks email or something is definitely a little interesting. You didn't mention this, but I'm sure this is true for you. It's really like, what are you entrusting this person with? You mentioned like, especially when it comes to OSs and stuff like that. Like, yeah, definitely. That's a, a huge deal. That's very important and very like, you really do need to take that seriously. If we're talking something smaller, like I downloaded a pedometer the other day, not really the end of the world. If it's a little bit buggy or if it's not as up to date as it should be, and especially being an app within the OS and I trust the OS, it's like the amount of damage it can do is probably pretty limited. Like it's not asking for microphone permissions. It's not asking for location permissions. I mean, it definitely, theoretically, it could be used to track. We've seen Meta do that, but yeah, it just kind of depends. What are you trusting it with? How big is it? What are other people that I trust saying about it? And that too, what are other people I trust saying about it? I don't really care what the rando on Reddit thinks. I care about people that I know are qualified and know what they're talking about. And third-party audits too. That's neither one of us mentioned that, but that's another thing. If they've been audited by like Cure 53 or Trail of Bits and they actually share the audit, to me, that's also like a big, you know, okay, they've had actual experts look at this thing, so... And really quick, uh, there's a second question here that Lady Lucifer asked. They said, are there any apps or functions you would not trust with free software? Short answer to this is no. There's no specific reason why something being free software per se would prevent me from using it. With that said, there are many characteristics of open source projects that I think tend to be higher than many proprietary counterparts that would prevent me from using it. And particularly what I mean by that is lack of support. So there are some pieces of software more particularly for business type things, like for example, business email. I'm not looking to roll out our own self-hosted business email for TechLore. Makes no sense, that's not something I'm trying to do, that's not my job, I don't wanna hire someone to do that. I want something with dedicated support, so if something goes wrong, we can't not get back to an important sponsor or an important business partner, or just someone needing help from us because we couldn't figure out our own stuff. So that's a situation where I think open source tends to be lacking is I feel like there tends to be less official support and there's more support from the community 
which I, I'm fine with in my personal life, and I think a lot of people are fine with, but there's some circumstances where I don't want that, and I want something more formal, and I want the guarantee of like customer support. I'm in the same boat. Something being free software would not automatically make me want to not use it. The only situation I could personally think of would be, and I mean, those are good points too, but I would say just kind of going back to your first question, given the choice between a very small, and again, it depends on the threat model here, a, a very small app that I don't know very well and I don't know if I can trust it, but it's open source versus a very well-established app that I know is going to be around for a while. I know I can trust it in terms of like, it's secure, it's functional. Again, if it's if it's something minor, like a to-do list, for example, I would rather go with the, the well-known app knowing that it's going to be stable, it's going to be functional. It's probably more secure or potentially more secure than the small app that has like one person who puts an hour a month into it. Our next question comes from Rasta. Do you have any thoughts on biohacking with privacy and security in mind, such as RFID tags for locks or even something like the VivoKey Apex Flex for 2FA or other use cases? I don't have strong thoughts on biohacking because I haven't looked into it a lot. It's something I do find interesting, but it's not something that I'm really interested in. So I haven't really put a lot of work into it. I would assume that there are probably a lot of privacy and security concerns here simply because it is such a niche thing. It's kind of the same issue we're having with cars right now. Like nobody is putting Linux on their car partially because that's not an option. And therefore, like the economy of scale is just not there. Nobody's doing it. Therefore, to do it is prohibitively expensive, mostly in terms of time and skill. But if that were to start filtering out and becoming more, it's like Linux in general, you know, 20, 30 years ago, nobody was using Linux because it required so much work to compile it and install it. It was buggy as hell and it just super crazy. But like now it's become more common. It's become more mainstream. It's become easier and more stable and more reliable and more compatible. And so now more people are doing it. And I, I think that's kind of where biohacking is in the sense of like, it's still in that first part. Like there's so few people doing it and it's so new and it requires so much investment that I just don't think there's probably, I'm guessing, I don't think there's probably a lot of privacy and security options there. I think if it were to become more common, which I'm not necessarily saying I want it to, it's again, it's not something I'm interested in, but just for the sake of people who are interested in it, like not to get too off topic, but when everybody went through the whole gluten-free craze, the advantage there was the people who actually had celiac and gluten sensitivities suddenly had a whole lot more options for food, which is super cool. And I, I think in that sense, I would love to see this catch on a little bit more just so that people who are interested in that have more options. But that's kind of my only thoughts on that. My only concern with that, these technologies, you know, like WPA came out, it was great. Then it was cracked. WPA2 comes out. Then WPA3 comes out. Like the encryption protocols and the type of things that are required to secure these devices change over time. And I feel like a lot of biohacking, it's a little bit harder to upgrade some of these things I've seen than getting it, going, going to the Apple store and buying a new phone, for example. So just something to think about. You know, if you're going to install anything in your body, uh, just think about how to get it out of your body. Good health advice, perhaps, as well by me. I'm not a doctor. This next question is from David Johnson, and I'm going to try to condense this because it took me a sec to understand what they were asking, and I'm just going to re-articulate it a little bit. Their question is, how do you approach the threat modeling of your threat model? And I, I think what they're really trying to say here is, do you kind of zoom out and look at the meta position of where something exists today and how that can change over time? So maybe you're doing well today, but does your threat model include any changes that may occur over time? It's things that you might not be able to see or predict, and are you adaptable enough to essentially incorporate those changes over time? I would say yes, but I would I don't know. I, I understand what you're saying about like a threat model of a threat model, but I would argue that someone who understands what they're trying to do and what they're trying to protect themselves from and what their threats are, if done well, you know, you can never be a hundred percent perfect, but should be able to see most situations coming. So I do think that a person who has a good perspective on what's going on, they don't need this meta kind of stance on the situation, in my opinion. And I think that they're already going to be thinking ahead on what can possibly go wrong. Because I think a good threat model and someone who has a good 
protection suite in place can be able to deal with most issues that are within the realm of possibilities that they've considered. On the other hand, I think that there are some situations where things are a little bit challenging. I think this was something I kind of alluded to when I made the video about uh, using stock Android for some things way back in the day. And pretty much what I said was every five years, I look back and go, man, I wish I considered this five years later. I think most people probably are pretty consistent with what's a concern today and what's a concern in maybe the next few years. But I would say over the course of 10 years, maybe that does start to become a big thing for people. So I would say what's more important than trying to predict the future, just make sure you have a good plan now. And I would make sure to check in with your plan on a consistent basis. That's what I think is more important is just being consistent updating things and understanding that what you decide on today is not what's going to maybe be the best in even a month from now. And that's the same thing with everything, right? Like health goals, work goals, just keep changing those and adapting things over time. I think, like you said, nothing's ever going to be perfect. And I think that's an important perspective to keep, not in the sense of just saying like, oh, I'm not even going to try, whatever. But in the sense of saying like, do your best and just accept, you know, it's like that, Um, what is that? The serenity prayer, God grant me the, the courage to change the things I can, the serenity to accept the things I can't, and the courage to know, or the wisdom to know the difference. It's It's kind of the same thing. Like, to me, that's all really threat modeling is, is in any given situation, you go, what could go wrong here? And how can I prevent it? Sorry, I'm trying to struggle how to articulate this. We'll use dating apps for an example. If you're going to use a dating app, kind of your choices are to go with real life dating or to suck it up and agree to the privacy policy. For some people, they may say, I'm cool with the real life thing. It's probably going to work better for you anyways, if we're being honest. But, you know, some people may say I'm really busy or I'm new to town. Like I would rather use an app and you would have to think like, okay, I can use maybe a voice over IP number. I can use a ma uh, uh, email alias. I can take a fresh picture that's not going to show up in a reverse image search, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you have to ask yourself like, okay, so what goes wrong if my account gets hacked and how can I mitigate that? Or, you know, somebody sees me from work or something. I guess what I'm trying to get at is like you mentioned, um, so for example, the first one you mentioned are like the case of like a war, you know, you can't really predict those most of the time. That's fair. And if you're in a situation where not even war, but like natural disaster, like I've thought of that. I live near a big city, if civil unrest breaks out, I have asked myself, like, what do I need to grab? How quickly can I assemble it? How quickly can I be in my car headed out of town? And then you also mentioned like things that aren't happening yet, but may start to happen. You mentioned like Clearview, 23andMe. Henry made a good point. Sometimes you can kind of look ahead and be like, well, in the case of 23andMe, it's only a matter of time before they start sharing the data. It stands to reason that this could get hacked. Or even just like, I want to wait and see how this turns out. Things like Clearview that we didn't see coming, I, I think are kind of those things where, like I said earlier, you kind of have to hit a point where you're like, well, I did my best. You can't predict everything. Things happen out of nowhere. And you just kind of have to do your best and accept the fact that it's never going to be perfect. Our last question comes from Coffee Horse. How do ISPs collect data on their users? Are HTTPS connections protecting us from ISPs collecting data? And do ISPs see full URLs we're using? For example, in the following URL, how much does the ISP see? So they use a, a Brave search, for example. So there's HTTPS colon slash slash search.brave.com slash search question mark. And they search for surveillance report from their desktop. So if I understand correctly, with HTTPS... All your ISP should be able to see is search.brave.com. They should not be able to see what you searched for or the fact that you use desktop. However, in a lot of cases, the default DNS is going to be your ISP. And therefore, your ISP will see, would they be able to see every page because of DNS? Or would it just be still search.brave.com? I believe with DNS, they'd be able to see uh, the domains you're accessing. The domain you visited, but nothing after the .com. So they would be able to see search.brave.com. Switching to a different DNS would fix that. But either way, from what we know, yeah, if it's HTTPS, they should only be able to see the domains and the subdomains. Then my first thought was like, why even use a DNS if you, or a VPN if you can just change the DNS? Because the VPN will still give you additional protections from the site you're visiting. Like, you know, for example, it'll change your IP address, which I've never lived anywhere that rotates IP addresses. I know a lot of people say residential places rotate IP addresses periodically. I've never lived anywhere that does that. A lot of the time, VPN providers will come with an enhanced DNS that will block known malware, known trackers, stuff like that, which you can do yourself as well. But that's just kind of the short answer, I guess. I quickly just went to Stack Exchange here because I, I didn't think there was a way to easily do this. But yeah, I guess... Some operators force their clients to install CA certificates. So, you know, just don't do that. If you 
if you install CA certificate, it's pretty much a van in the middle. The only thing I wanted to add here is it, it's more hypothetical and it's less of something that I think might be done on a wide scale. But keep in mind, there have been some evidence of things like deep packet inspection for ISPs where they can try to analyze the data packets, even if it's HTTPS. But I, I don't think that's something that's being done on a super wide scale. I think it's something like in a criminal investigation. If you're a Reddit user um, and you post something really bad on Reddit, and then they're able to try to analyze data packets to tie the time that you posted something on Reddit based on when law enforcement reached out. You know, like What I'm trying to say here is that I think if you're just trying to stop your ISP from being able to see a lot of what you're doing, Using HTTPS is a big step for that, and changing your DNS is a big step for that. If you want them to not even see the basic sites that you're visiting, that's when you're going to be you know, accessing something like a VPN to try to prevent things a little bit more, or using Tor. We're preventing ISPs from seeing more and more traffic through all this additional encryption that we're adding through transit, which is really cool. Again, we had some good questions this week. How we trust free software, biohacking, kind of the future of our threat models, HTTPS connections and what ISPs can see. And uh, yeah, it was just really great to see all these questions. And I really want to thank everybody for asking them. They're fun to answer. And also, it's just fun engagement. It's fun to have a little community that we really enjoy engaging with. So thank you all. And also, uh, we have to say thank you for your support on the podcast because you're all patrons and you're keeping it free for everybody else. So definitely go ahead and join them on patreon.com slash surveillance pod. You can ask us a question right now by joining and uh, tuning in next week. So thank you all uh, for tuning in and we'll see you then.